So, greetings from Orlando, Florida. I am Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And this is going to be a Think Vitamin Q&A. It is 12 Eastern Standard Time in the U.S. here in Florida. And it should be 5 p.m. over in the U.K. So cheers to our U.K. viewers. I know you guys are staying at work watching this. And uh, it should be 9 a.m. over in California. So good for you for waking up early. Um, we're going to be answering questions uh, for about 20 to 30 minutes. And um, so hopefully you guys have some good uh, design and development questions. Um, we're going to wait for just a little bit to let the um, chat go ahead and fill up uh, with questions. But uh, yeah, we'll be answering questions for like 30 minutes. So we have a few people in the chat. Hello to you guys. And it looks like we have our first question here uh, from Digital Club. Do you guys think the web designers of today need to know the fundamentals of development in order to survive? Um, yeah, uh, I, I think so. Um, I, I, I think it's good for any web designer really to know as much about development as they can. Um, because it's definitely going to help you uh, be a d better designer in a lot of ways, and it's going to help you communicate with your developer a lot easier. Definitely. It's a lot about the communication, because as a designer, you're going to be working with a developer a lot. And de developers the same. It goes both ways. I think developers need to have a good idea of design, because you're just always communicating between design and developers. And just being able to speak the same language at some level is going to help you immensely. It's going to cut frustration and it's going to sort of just make that flow that makes really effective web development possible. Definitely. Um, so let's see. Can we fix Jim's audio? OK, we, we, got our, we got our production guys working on that right now. Um, let's see. Can we expect a backbone JavaScript tutorial anytime soon on Think Vitamin? Yes, you can. Um, Good news. <laughs> Um, sorry, we're, we're, I don't know if my sound is good. No, my sound is awful. I don't know. I can speak closer to Nick. Okay. Are we better? All right, I'm getting, I think I'm getting the okay here. Uh, yes, we will be doing um, some Backbone work. Actually, our next master class is going to be integrating Backbone.js into an offline geolocation-based mobile application, mobile web application. So we're going to be seeing how to use Backbone.js in this particular case, to actually run an application completely locally. Uh, obviously, there's m more cool things where you can interact with web services and stuff, and we'll be getting to those later, but I think we're going to see a really cool use of Backbone. Yeah. So, let's see. We got Jim's audio fix. Going to be using Backbone.js. So, while we're waiting for the chat to fill up with questions, by the way, guys, if you're not familiar with what Jim is talking about with master classes, uh, Jim and I do tutorials over at membership.thinkvitamin.com and we have a bunch of five minute videos that we put out every day um, that really go in depth and show you how to do web design and web development you know, step by step. And we recently launched a new thing called master classes and so if you're a gold member of Think Vitamin membership uh, you can check out these really deep dives. They're usually about 90 minutes long, and they're project-based. And uh, Jim is going to be doing an HTML5 web app yep. for his next one. So we're just finishing that up and starting production uh, today, actually. So yeah. we're going to be seeing that very soon as we get that produced. But I think you're going to really enjoy the techniques and technologies we use in that app, including Backbone.js and jQuery Mobile. So we have a few more questions here in the chat now. Wow, it's really filling up. Uh, Susan Design asks, how about HTML5? Should I learn that instead of Flash? Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, really, it depends on the situation. Uh, but I think most of the time I'm going to say, yes, you should go with HTML5 instead of Flash. But it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Right. HTML5 is pretty awesome. Uh, but it can't do everything. There are still some instances where, you know, Flash is going to be the way to go. Exactly. I um, want to keep moving here. Uh, 
what about a developer interested in web design? Where should he start? Wow. Um, um, well, I mean, Think Vitamin Membership obviously has a ton of great tutorials. Between Nick and myself, uh, we have a lot of uh, cross-discipline experience. So Nick's done plenty of development work in the past. And so his, a lot of his design uh, tutorials and skills actually really, I think, resonate well with designers. I've been able to watch them and understand them really well. So I think that's a great place to start. There's probably a lot of other resources you can recommend. Yeah, I think, I think if you're a developer that's first, you know, that's just starting to get into the design world, I highly recommend you check out the Elements and Principles of Art, which that's not a book or anything. It's just the Elements and Principles of Art is just a general concept. Um, I think those really resonate well with someone who is technically minded, uh, just because you know they're they're very technical basically. And uh, for a developer, that's really the approach that you're probably going to want to take. All right, we got another one. Where do you guys get your TextMate bundles? I've looked everywhere for the SAS bundles Nick's used in the, one, in the training and have not found them. Um, well, basically, I mean, when I look for a TextMate bundle, I usually just Google the name of the technology, TextMate bum bundle, and cross my fingers. Um, usually, hopefully, you'll get at least one hit. There's actually some really cool bundles for stuff that you didn't even think there would be bundles for. And you can try them out. Uh, if there's more of them, hopefully look for maybe a blog post comparing them or just try them out. Um, I'm not sure about Nick's specific one. Uh, we can do some research on that and try to either tweet it out or get it to you some other way. I'm sure we can find it. Yeah. Are, are they talking about just the theme? or Because I, I, think, I think the one that I'm using is just comes with TaxMade, isn't it? Oh, no, the SAS bundle for, oh, oh, for oh. actually syntax coloring. Okay. And, snippets and stuff. Yeah, and that I don't is know. something I, that, that's a good I can't remember where we got it. I think it's yeah, a Hamel and SAS bundle that we probably installed a while ago. We'll make sure to get that information on the videos. Yeah, if somebody could link that up in the chat, that would be awesome if you know where that is. And we'll try to put it on the actual tutorial videos so you can find them too. So I think we're ready to move on here. Uh, the next question is, how scalable is HTML5 offline storage? At what point would you say, that's too much data? When the browser says, that's too much data, it's too much data. Um, <laughs> it actually, as you start putting data in, it will hit a capacity. I think the default right now is supposed to be around 5 megs. Um, it's sort of a recommendation in the spec. Each uh, browser probably is different. But it will definitely complain and tell you your capacity has been reached. So you can get away with a lot. You can put a lot of data in there. I mean, if you're storing encoded binary data, it could fill up really quick, but as far as like managing just text data and serialized objects and stuff, you can put a lot away in the browser. And I mean, obviously, HTML5 data is going to be local to that browser, so if you're doing something where they want access on multiple computers, probably not the best way to persistently store the data, but as maybe a temporary gap while they're offline or something, HTML5 storage is really super useful. Yeah, so, wow, we're already up to about 128 viewers. If you guys could tweet this out, post it on Facebook, share this link with your friends, it's justin.tv slash carsonified. That would be super awesome. Uh, so we got a lot more questions in the chat here. Um, this one looks pretty good from John Turner. What are your thoughts on Hamel? Uh, I don't know. I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a Hamel addict now. Um, Hamel and SAS and you know a lot of the other abstractions, they can be sort of daunting to get into because you think, oh, it's another layer of abstraction. Is it really helping? You know, Am I going to find little cracks in the abstraction where I can't do quite where I want? I think Hamel and SAS, you know, to be honest, really nail it. Um, pretty much all my Ruby projects, I use Hamel. Um, even, even in um, just like JavaScript HTML projects, I'll actually just, I have a small like Sinatra app that just basically serves static files or processes Haml files into HTML files because it's so much faster to just write Haml instead of HTML. Um, so, I mean, when I do tutorial videos, I got to go back to vanilla HTML and honestly, it's, it's kind of sad. I don't, <laughs> I'm like, uh, I have to type out all this stuff. So, I'm really into Haml. Obviously, you know, you got to see if it works for you and your team, but I think it's really cool. Um, so we've got more questions in the chat here. Uh, I would like to know what you're thinking about the NoSQL movement. Um, that's a question for you, Jim. Um, it's good. I mean, 
basically more choice in the tools you can use are going to be a positive thing, really, no matter what. Um, the danger I do see is using NoSQL for everything because you know it's in vogue or popular. But there's definitely situations where you know being able to store a ton of data in a sort of unstructured way makes a lot of sense. And we definitely use both on our apps. We use you know traditional you know uh, SQL-based uh, data stores as well as NoSQL data stores for other purposes. And you know they can coexist together, but they're really good for different things. So I mean I'm I'm really all for it, and I like having a wider variety of tools to work with. And I hope we continue to see more innovation on both sides of the fence, actually. Um, so we got another question here. Uh, what JavaScript frameworks do you use? Well, I'd say primarily we use jQuery, but. Yeah, so you know, you know, as, as the DOM abstraction layer, uh, jQuery is sort of our go-to. Um, obviously, the other ones, prototype, move tools, and everything are really good. Then there's other layers where you sort of get into the more application framework. Uh, you can go really heavy duty with things like Sprout Core, Cappuccino, um, some things like Sencha, which was XJS before. Right. And those are and YUI as well. I've used YUI tools to varying degrees, either as a full application framework or as a smaller subset of tools. And yeah, they're all they're all really good. It's it's good to at least like look at them and try to do like at least a page with everything and just see if it makes sense to you. Obviously, jQuery is sort of the default for that level, but you know, you don't know what you're missing if you don't try other tools. So I definitely recommend you go out and give some other ones a shot. So we have another question here. Are there any scripts you could recommend for making IE7 and IE8 behave like standards compliant browsers? Anything WordPress specific would be doubly awesome. Well, I don't have anything WordPress specific, but there is a script and I'm blanking on the name. I mean, I, I think it's called right now, it's probably now called ie8.js. It used to be called ie7.js. Yeah. And it was a whole bunch of, I want to say, was it Dean Edwards, I think, made it. Um, a lot of cool hacks and tricks to sort of go both ie6 and ie7 into becoming more uh, more standards compliant. Well, to the degree that you can. So like right. PNG fixes and weird double margin errors. So like all these little tricks that you can use to make IE suck less. So it's sort of all compacted into one really clever script. And I think it should just be, I think if you Google IE7.js or IE8.js, one of those should come up. Probably come up. If somebody could link that in the chat, that would be super awesome. I think there's also, um, I think it's also worth mentioning H the HTML5 shiv. The HTML5 shim, yeah. The, I mean, the, yeah, there's a lot of polyfill type things, and what those do are take you know certain HTML5 elements that um, don't work in IE and make them work. I mean, the most basic one is the HTML5, yeah, shim. Sorry, web shims are the other thing, mm -hmm. and that will just do a piece of JavaScript that basically makes the HTML5 elements work syntactically within the browser. It won't actually make Canvas do a Canvas, but it'll make it not break the parser when you try to do it. But there are things like web shims can try to fill in different browser holes with other fallbacks. So there's a lot of things you can do. Ooh, so here's a good one. Uh, what do you think about Sprout Core? Um, I guess that's like a JavaScript framework. Uh, Sprout Core, I like the idea of. I've used it a while back. Um, I think it was that was one in Apple's, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And actually, one of the things I'm really excited about Sprout Core. I mean, they're, they're really good things. They're really more application frameworks than anything. So you have to sort of plan your application around Sprout Core. And while that's definitely a good thing, and there's a lot of competition in that area, uh, a lot of the time I just want to integrate parts of these things into my application. I already have an application. I don't really want to rebuild it for Sprout Core or Cappuccino or uh, Essentia or whatever. And so I want to integrate smaller pieces. And one of the cool projects that I know I've seen Yehuda talking about, Yehuda Katz, was um, Sprout Core Amber or Sprout Core Lite, which takes a lot of the cool you know, data processing parts, templating parts, and makes them available in a more lightweight package, which you can integrate more easily into your applications. And I'm really excited about that. And so Backbone is kind of another lightweight application framework that I really like. I can integrate it easily into my code 
without having to build an application around it like you would for Sprout Core or some of the larger ones. So we have another question. 